Hey, welcome to this video. We're going to be talking about using and analyzing data displays. I'm going to be going through the study island lesson here in this video. Using and analyzing data displays is a challenging skill because you could learn how to read one graph very, very well. And then the next problem, it's a completely different graph. And there's so many different types of graphs. I'm going to show you all the different types that are present here in this uh, study island lesson. And we're going to go through these. Let's take a look at the first one. Cafeteria lunch lines. They give us a nice graph here about the number of students, the cafeteria lunch lines, and they give us the grades of these students, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders. All right, and we see over here our nice little key tells us what the colors represent, line one, line two, and line three. So the question down here, as marked as example, is how many more students choose lunch line three than lunch line two? All right. Well, if we're looking at how many more choose lunch line three than lunch line two, I need to look at all lunch line threes and all lunch line twos. So let's take a look at lunch line two first. Sixth graders lunch line two, it looks like 160. Seventh graders lunch line two, it looks like 40. And eighth graders lunch line two, it looks like it's halfway between 40 and 60, so I'm gonna say 50. And if we add up all of those, we get lunch line two has 250 students that choose it. Now we go to three. And I'm just gonna read each of them. So sixth graders, 140 sixth graders choose lunch line three. Seventh graders, we've got 120 seventh graders that choose lunch line three. And eighth graders, we've got 110. Once again, it's in between 100 and 120, halfway there, so we can say that it's 110. In this case, now I add them all up and I find that I get 370 that choose lunch line three altogether. Well, how many more choose it? We simply subtract 370 minus 250. And we find our answer here that 120 more students choose lunch line three than lunch line two. When you're using and analyzing data displays, it's not simply enough to just read the data on the graph. They're usually gonna ask you to do something with that data. Here, when we read it, we were reading these values. Those are the values I identified in red on the graph. And then what did I do with those values? That's what I did here. I added them up to find the totals and then subtracted them to find the difference. That's where using and anal analyzing data displays goes further than just reading graphs. Let's go down to the next one. This one's looking at a line graph. All right, variables that have continuous intervals are broken sequences are best represented by line graphs. Now, what this makes this, this is different from a linear graph. Line graphs connect a line between each of the scattered plot points that show the different data values. Linear graphs means that it's going to be a solid line all the way through and all the points will be on that line. So that's the difference here. Let's take a look at the question. I'm gonna scroll down so we can see the graph and the question there. All right, Jason, Stephen, and Andrew made a line graph to show the cumulative number of miles they had run for five days, at the end of which day had they run a cumulative total of 32 miles altogether. In this case here, we're looking at a graph and we can see each day is marked off here on the x-axis, and they're simply asking you to read the values and add them up, then see which one is 32. So if I look at each of these, I can see that I've got, in this one right here, I've got a one, a two, and a three, so for day one, we add those three values and we get six. Day two, same thing, I see now I've got a three, I've got a four, and I've got a, looks like 6.5, or roughly that. If you estimate slightly different from what they did, that's okay, because either way, you will notice it is not 32, and so we know that it's not either day one nor day two. If we keep going, and you see that they did here, we can see that it's not 23 for day three, it is indeed day four. In day four, they had eight, they had a 13, and 11. So this one's 11, and this one's 13. And they had all three of those, if we add up eight plus 13 plus 11, we find that 32 was the day. So day four was the day where they ran 32 miles altogether. Let's take a look at the next question. This next question presents a circle graph. A circle graph all right, is where you have an entire circle that represents 100% of what it's about. So in this case, Carrie's monthly budget, this circle represents 100% of her budget in a month. And we can see that her budget 
is $3,000 per month. That means this whole graph represents $3,000. That is the 100% mark. And each section of the circle graph is a part of that $3,000 in this case. We want to know how much money has she budgeted per month from housing and food. That's our question right here. Housing is blue, food is green. So that is this section of our circle graph represented by 32% and 18.3%. Two ways we can go about doing it. Down below, you can see that they took 32% of $3,000 and 18.3% of $3,000. And after they got those amounts by multiplying your whole number, 3,000, by the percent as a decimal, 0.32 and 0.1183, sorry, 183, after they got those values saying that these were representing $960 and $549, they then added those amounts together to get their total, in this case, which is $1,509. If you wanted to do it differently, there is an alternate route you can take. It still involves addition. It still involves multiplying by a percent. But what I chose to do was to actually add these two percents together. So if you add 32% together and you add 18.3 together, you get a total of, let me just write it over here, 18.3 plus 32. You get a total of 50.3%. And then I found 50.3% of 3,000. So I did 3,000 times 0 0.503, all right? At which point that gave me the amount of $1,509, all right? And so it gives me the same amount either way, as you notice, but you can either add the percents together first and then calculate that percent of the whole, or you can find the individual percents of the whole and then add them together. Either way is fine. Let's take a look at the next question. The next one is a stem and leaf plot. Stem and leaf plots are actually very similar to histograms in that I could draw a little box around each of these so that I can see which values are the greatest. All right, so if you notice here, our hundreds are our smallest down here. That's where this 10 is representing there because that's 100. All right, our 90s all right, are represented right here. Those are the 90s. And you can see our 80s are actually the greatest in this stem and leaf plot. We see there's the most value of 80s here. And it kind of takes a histogram and flips it on its side and marks out the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100s by a stem represented by the tens digits and beyond. So six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 to represent those. That's what a stem and leaf plot does. And it also takes a batch of data that would be listed in a long list. If we were to write out every number side by side, it'd be a long list. And instead, it makes it a nice, compact view so that we can see that. But let's move down and see our question. All right, so what are the mean, median, mode, and range for the above stem and leaf plot? All right, well, the mean, let's start there, average. In order to do that, I have to add them all up. And if you just grab your calculator, just go ahead and pause the video, try to do it yourself, but grab your calculator and put in each number. So I'm just gonna list out this first one. It's 65 plus 66. plus 67, plus 68, plus 68. And if you add all those up, you'll get the total for the 60s, but you keep going, all right? Add up all of the 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s. If you do all of that, you'll find that your total that you get is 2,030. Then we need to divide this total by the number of values. And we can count those simply by counting one, two, three, four, five. And the nice thing that I like to do with a stem and leaf plot is after I get that first one of five, I actually chunk it off like this. Well, that's a group of five, and I have four groups of five here. So five, 10, 15, 20, and then I count from there. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 25 all together. So stem and leaf plots also give me a quick way to count it out. And if I do that division, I can see that I get a mean of 81.2. That's how I find my mean, otherwise known as our average. Let's go on to the next one. All right, how do I find my median? Well, my median in this case is the middle number of our set. 
And you could write out all the numbers in a row if you'd like to, but instead I will count starting with the first in the far left and the last of the far right. Now it's kind of hard to see because there's only one number here, but I'll show you what I mean. Because after I mark off five, and uh, 65 and 100, I'll then go to the next one, which would be 66. The next one here, I actually come to the end of the next row and mark from that way, moving in. And I make sure that I'm marking the same amount off on each side. So you can go in larger batches, like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, all right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right, but make sure you're always canceling out an equal amount on each side so that if you get down to one number, if there was an odd amount, which we know that there's 25 values, so we'll get to one middle number, but if there's an even amount, you're gonna get to two middle numbers, and you'll have to add those and divide by two to find the actual median and the middle. So if I cancel one more from each side, we find that this number right here, the two, is my median, but that's not just any two. It's combined with this eight, making it 82 altogether for my median, and that's why my median here is 82. Mode simply looks at which value occurs the most in a set. So if I look and I just start looking at my numbers, there's only one five in this row, one six, seven, there's two eights, okay? So that's my record so far, 68. Keep going up, two four, so 74. There can be two modes, 68 and 74 would currently hold the mode. All right, keep going, uh, only one, seven, one, eight, one, two, three, four, two five, so 85 could also be the mode at this point because those all have two values. We're looking for anything that beats it, and there it is, 92 has three values, making 92 the one that occurs the most in our set, and that's why 92 is my mode. Our last bit of data is looking at the range. The range takes my least one and subtracts it from my greatest value, my maximum minus my minimum. And if I subtract them, maximum minus minimum, we find that 35 is the range for this set of data. All right, range is maximum minus minimum. Interquartile range is the upper quartile minus lower quartile. Don't get those confused. Let's take a look at the next question. All right, taking a look at this bar graph. The three most popular deli meats sold at Delicious Deli are turkey, ham, and roast beef. The bar graph below shows the average number of pounds of turkey, ham, and roast beef sold at the deli over the past five years. Use the graph, here's the question down here. Use the graph to predict in which month the deli will sell the most amount of ham this year. So when we're using a prediction, we basically look at answering that question for last year and assume that it's going to be the exact same. So really, when they say use the graph to predict in which month the deli will sell the most amounts of ham this year, we're really looking at which month did the deli sell the most amount of ham last year. Well, ham I can see right here is this blue color, so I'm just looking at which month has the highest blue. And if you scan across, you can see that September has the highest blue, and therefore September will be the month that we will predict will have the most amount of ham sold this year. All right, we got ourselves another circle graph here. The circle graph below shows the percentage of the staff budget that was allocated to salaries for each department for a company last year. All right, so we've got our staff budget. Remember, the entire staff budget represents 100%, and let's find out what that is. In this case, it says it in the next sentence reading down here. All right, the company is expecting to have 1,500,000 in the budget for salaries, so that's 100%. 100% is equal to 1,500,000. All right, using the graph, predict the amount of money that will be allocated to the accounting department salaries this year. Once again, we just look at what it was last year and assume it's going to be the same because we're not given any information that would indicate that it would change. So in this case, I'm really just looking at what's the amount of money that was allocated to the accounting department salaries the, uh, last year. Well, last year it was accounting is this light blue one, and so that's this part of the pie, all right? And that's 15%. So we are simply going to take 15% of this 1,500,000. Remember, to multiply by a percent, we must multiply by that percent as a decimal. In this case, it's gonna be 0 0.15, and you can see that they did that work down here, multiplying that to get $225,000. That's what we can predict will be allocated to the accounting department salaries this year. 
Now we're looking at ourselves a line graph. In this case, Johnson Hospital created the line graph below to show the number of boys and the number of girls who were born in their hospital during each month last year. Using the graph, predict during which month the hospital can expect to have the most uh, boys born this year. Again, if we're predicting, we are just looking at what was it last year. We're gonna assume it's gonna be the same since we have not given, been given any information to tell us that it would change. So I'm looking at last year, which month had the most boys? Well, identify the difference. The boys are our square points and they are connected with this nice uh, blue teal line. And where is the highest square? Well, if we look, we can see the highest square is right here. All right, and so it looks like that was about 15 births for boys in the month of number four. Hopefully you know your months of the year in order to answer this question. Remember it's January, February, March, April. So month four is April. And that's the month that we would predict would have the most boys this year. That's it for our lesson here and all the graphs. Again, keep looking at more and more graphs. Do some study island assignments. Go to our practice test examples because there's a lot more graphs out there. And every graph you get a chance to look at is another opportunity for you to do better on this skill. Good luck.